everyone. So let's kick off. Hello, thank you very much for joining us today at the French ANZ Business Days 2020. And if I may say bonjour et bienvenue. Uh, I'm Louise Santos, I'm a special counsel at Pinsent Masons, and we're a multinational law firm with a focus in Australia on infrastructure and energy. Uh, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. And I would also like to thank the French Australian Chamber of Commerce for organising the conference and the French Embassy, Austrade and sponsors and in particular Schneider Electric today for their support throughout. So our topic for this session is the circular economy, the next revolution for sustainable cities and communities. Uh, it's something that I think um, has perhaps entered into the mainstream a bit in recent years, but I can imagine a lot of people don't know a lot about it. I'm, I'm one of those. So we have a great panel here for you today. Our speakers today are Tony Pekoski, Health and Safety and Environment Leader for Schneider Electric, uh, Mark Van Hook, uh, CEO at Suez Australia and New Zealand, Laurent Safre, Head of Oceana Region Pierre Fabre Group, and Rodrigo Lima, Managing Director Danone. Um, as we go through, if you have any questions for our speakers, please type them into the chat Q&A at the side of the video, and I'll keep an eye on those. And we'll also have a 15 minute live Q&A at the end of the session. So um, if I can ask our panel to introduce themselves and their company, um, and um, just for a few minutes, and then we'll get going into, into the session proper. Uh, Rodrigo, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Luis. Um, so my name is Rodrigo, as Luis has just mentioned. Um, I work for Danone in Australia, New Zealand, and Danone is a food and beverage company that specializes in water, dairy, plant-based products, and also specialized nutrition products. And circularity is a vital element in our strategy, so I'm very happy to be invited uh, to this panel. Lovely, thank you. Tony? So, Health, Safety and Environment Leader for Australia New Zealand with Schneider Electric. Schneider has been operating in Australia and New Zealand for a number of decades, but most recently changed its name in the late 1999s to actually Schneider Electric Pacific. Um, we are an operating entity that does a lot in energy management from uh, servicing equipment through industry and homes, as well as distributing uh, energy management equipment as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Laurent? Hello everyone, I'm thrilled to be with you today. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to present the Piafa Group. Uh, in a nutshell, um, Piafa Group is the second largest French pharmaceutical company privately owned in France and the second largest dermo cosmetic company worldwide. I've been working for the Piafa Group for the last 20 years uh, and uh, in different countries and now I'm very, very thrilled to be uh, managing the Oceania region for the Piafa Group and uh, I'm, we are located in, a, in a Sydney, uh, Australia. Thank you. And last but not least, Mark. Thank you, Louise. Uh, so my name is Mark Van Hoek. Uh, Van Hoek. I'm um, the CEO for Suez in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Suez is a global leader across 130 countries in water and waste management. So we, we try to, to close the loop and, and close the circle on both the value chains. It's very topical for this particular topic, obviously. Been working for the group for 22 years. Uh, in various countries as well, and over the last five years here in uh, in Australia, uh, where we have started our business roughly 35 years ago. So we've been here um, with our water technologies and our waste management solutions for uh, a couple of decades as well. And uh, very pleased to be on this panel as well, obviously. obviously. Great, thank you all. Um, perhaps if I, Rodrigo, if I could go back to you with the first question, could you um, perhaps explain to us what circularity means for Danone? Yes, um, well, circularity is a vital element in our packaging strategy, uh, which is a key element in our overarching sustainability strategy, which also includes carbon emission reduction, regenerative agriculture and water stewardship. Um, you know, today's uh, packaging, uh, mainstream packaging system is mostly linear, um, and this is quite problematic uh, for us. Uh, our, our packaging is super important for us to be able to 
uh, deliver high quality food and beverage to our consumers. But we don't want to do this at the expense of the environment. Um, and that's why at the known we are striving very hard to move from a linear packaging system to a circular packaging system. Uh, in a linear packaging system, we use virgin materials from nature. And after these materials are consumed, they mostly turn into waste or pollution. Um, and in here, we would like to increase the percentage of usage of recycled materials in our packaging, which today stands at 36%. And our aim is to have 100% of circular packaging by 2025, which means that we are working very hard on innovation to reduce the packaging elements that we don't need, that are not absolutely necessary. And in the packaging materials that we do need, we want to make them 100% reused, recycled, or compostable by 2025. Um, we do this because our company, um, one of the main reasons to exist of our company is to protect and nourish the health of the people, but also of the environment. And we want to play our part in transitioning from a linear packaging economy into a circular packaging economy. Thank you very much. Uh, Laurent, if I could go to you next, I think um, is similar, um, a very broadly say, a similar, you, um, Pierre Fabre is also involved in, in consumer products. Um, so if you could give us some examples of circularity uh, within PFAP, that would be great. Of course, my pleasure. Uh, maybe just before uh, beginning, I would like to um, maybe specify that we are a very uh, unique uh, company um, in France, um, particularly uh, because Mr. PFAP gave uh, all his belongings and his companies to, to, um, to a non-profit organization, the PFAP Foundation. So that really makes us very different, and we are all at PFAP working for, for non-profit. So that really, uh, you know, uh, speaks volumes in terms of ethics and what's behind. So our commitment to um, circular economy, carbon footprint um, reduction is very strong. And we've um, implemented a transversal organization called Green Mission within the PFA group that is really um, entitled in, um, you know, uh, supporting the sustainable development of our company. We are contributing to 16 of the 17 objectives of the United Nations for, for that specific um, um, commitment. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you examples. Uh, such uh, I, I can't, you know, I can't uh, uh, not promote some of our products here. But you have here a, a, a recent release of the Chloran um, uh, shampoo called Aquatic Mint, and this is a, a new generation of shampoos that has been that have been uh, uh, eco-designed and eco-produced. So what it means that, uh, as an example, the active ingredient it's a, it's a plant, Aquatic Mint, is being harvested by our plants in France. Um, and then we use the, um, the active ingredient uh, in our extraction plant uh, through a very specific um, way to extract active ingredients. Uh, it's called um, eco-native uh, extraction. And this, is, um, this green extraction is actually not using any solvent, any water. So it's, it's helped us to get a, a very pure active ingredient without uh, by reducing also the carbon uh, emission by 71%. So that's, that's great. And also, um, you know, when this um, uh, extraction has been done, the, the residues of the plants are used in uh, our uh, boiler, uh, eco-boiler, that is providing green energy to, to the plant manufacturing. And the residues at the end of the plants, uh, the ashes actually are given back to earth, to the soil, through um, the compost. So, you know, this is really circular uh, from the extract to, um, to the plant, back to the plant. Uh, then we eco-produce, um, and we, uh, by, by eco-producing, we make sure that we use, you know, recycling, recycled um, uh, product, that our packaging is recyclable, and, and also that our formula is biodegradable. So we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, provide consumers with the, with the best product, the, most, the safest product, but also uh, trying to reduce our um, carbon footprint and make sure that we do that uh, on a very sustainable way. That was one of the examples. Uh, also, what we try to do is to provide innovations uh, such as, you know, um, something like a dry shampoo. So we, you know, we reduce by 500 liters uh, a year the use of water. Dry shampoo, obviously, 
um, is lighter for transportation, so this is a great, uh, great improvement. And also, um, the packaging is in aluminum, which is highly recyclable, as you know. And last but not least, and I, I promise I stop promoting products here, but mm -hmm. last but not least, we are, we are developing um, um, bar shampoos, which are, you know, uh, it's a very new, uh, new innovation. We don't use water anymore, and uh, bar shampoos can be used, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, under the shower, and uh, you know, it's 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 lighter, uh, fully biodegradable. So this is you know the evolution and uh, innovation that which is behind uh, our commitment to the circular economy. Thank you. You mentioned aluminium. I read a fabulous statistic over the weekend. That something like seventy percent of the aluminium ever mined is still in production. Something something phenomenal like that. It's, it's hugely recyclable. Um, Tony uh, Schneider Electric was obviously a different type of company or not producing products that people are going to pick up off the, the shelves in the shops. What does sustainability and sorry, circularity to be specific um, mean to Schneider? Look, we've been really bold at Schneider Electric all the way from our CEO uh, through to how we actually develop and produce our products here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, circular economy for us, rust, our consumers are slightly different to the previous two speakers. Our consumers, even if we talk about our technicians or our electricians that are buying from our wholesalers, are holding us to account because they want to see this circular economy now more and more so. And whilst we've traditionally seen, you know, those those normal mum and dad shoppers asking for it, we're also seeing people within the industrial trades asking for these types. So what we're seeing is, you know, the expectation that we're not sending out every little uh, package with our products, you know, that we're using 100% recyclable materials to package with cardboard, making sure that even if we're disposing of our products, how are we disposing of it? And the request from our clients to ensure that, you know, once upon a time that we were reporting on health and safety statistics, we're seeing this environmental statistics coming out more and more from our clients as well. So it's something that we're seeing, you know, through that whole life cycle of our business. Our global supply chain is such a big part of what we do, but the expectations for those technicians, just those mum and dad, you know, small businesses expecting of us to make sure that we're enabling them to be better as well is really important. So circular economy for us is a big part. Um, we're seeing, you know, some bold statements from net zero carbon emissions. Um, we're also seeing, you know, carbon neutrality emissions as well, but as well as total zero waste to landfall ambitions that we're really seeing within our business. So that's circular, you know, truly embedding that in our whole supply chain is something that we're really looking forward to. Great. Mark, if I can go to you next. Um, to, to go back to the title of our, our, um, our session, we're talking about um, the next revolution in cities and communities. And Tony was speaking just there about, um, about partnering with, um, with their uh, supply chain. Um, does Suez have a um, similar engagement with, with stakeholders and, and partners in your business? Absolutely. Uh, you can imagine that um, in both the water and waste management cycle that you deal with a lot, of, a lot of, I would say, stakeholders. And the previous speakers have talked about it already. They all have issues or challenges around waste management or water preservation or energy uh, consumption. So, and that applies to each and every one of us. So uh, Suez has a lot of different companies as clients. Uh, we have uh, 55,000 clients roughly, but also basically everybody in this country is an actor when it comes to the environment. So as such, we have a lot of interactions and we work a lot with partners as well. Um, obviously, uh, partners for us and regulators are important. So working with government and also trying to influence government in order to drive circular economy out outcomes is something that is very important for us but also the general public. And for that, it's education, it's, it's talking about what we're trying to achieve and how they can help supporting more circular outcomes in terms of how they, uh, say, procure themselves, how they buy stuff, but also how they source separate their waste or how, what they can do in terms of water preservation, for instance. So these are things that we are um, very active in. And I'll give you one example, which I think is, is quite interesting. We work with NGOs as well. We work with communities in order to not only work in improving, I would say, um, processes, but also thinking about how can we preserve um, the natural capital of this planet, right? So we have uh, engagement with, I'd say, the, the Nature Conservative uh, Association Foundation, where we're trying to restore um, the reefs and, and oyster reefs in particular, which are also helping in, um, in purifying water. 
So as in this example, we are not bringing uh, oyster shelves anymore to landfills. We're collecting them separately. We, we're, um, we're, let's say, repurposing them around the reefs and, and, and helping the environment at the same time. Another one is also where we partner with a, a small, very dedicated company called Yumi, which is there for food waste, per, uh, um, let's say, uh, prevention of food waste. And they are not, let's say, uh, when certain food cannot longer be, uh, let's say, used or cannot get to a, 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 the final customer, we're trying together with them to repurpose that in, in finding other alternatives for consumption still, because it's good to be consumed, but for logistical reasons or for packaging reasons, because the, the labels are not correct, they can still very well be used. And we're working with these partners as well in order to prevent food waste from happening. So. As such, we have um, many different, I would say, angles with very different actors and, uh, and uh, stakeholders when it comes to dealing with circular outcomes in both water and waste management. Thank you. Laurent, if I could come back to you now. Um, PFR is obviously, um, like all uh, the companies that, that we're talking to today, um, a global company, but um, do you find that there are different uh, challenges um, at facing the circular economy when you're working in Australia to, to how you might deal with things elsewhere in the world? Well, you know, it's, uh, we, in Australia, we have a, a subsidiary, but it's, very, it's mainly commercial. We don't have any you know, manufacturing here, uh, but definitely our commitment um, locally is, is, is paramount for the, for the company. I mean, we are all trying to develop local initiatives, and uh, that's what we've done here in, in Australia. So uh, first of all, with um, you know 17,000 kilometers from uh, from headquarter, um, means that we are very conscious about the um, carbon footprint emission. So we are uh, amongst the subsidiaries that are very much involved in reducing dramatically the carbon footprint. Um, we want to be uh, locally uh, carbon neutral, um, and uh, to do so, we have we, we partner with some. Uh, with some companies, um, especially our 3PL, uh, 3PL is, uh, you know, has a strong commitment in uh, reducing their carbon footprint, and we, we are monitoring, making sure that we have a, you know, a common goal uh, together. And we are um, also taking specific initiatives um, through very, very uh, uh, powerful program. We are you know, proudly partnering with Future Planet. I don't know if you know. Future Planet is, is run by uh, Qantas, and it's, they have very strong um, um, commitment to support and to help to reduce uh, overall carbon footprint. So, f as an example, uh, Pierre Fab Australia has partnered by uh, with the Bringing Back the Rouge uh, program in Queensland and the uh, fire mitigation in, in uh, Northern Territory. So that's the kind of initiatives we are, we, are, we are taking locally, and we, we we embrace and we want all the employees at Pierre Fab Australia to be you know to be involved as well. It's not just a um, you know corporate program; it's also employees program. So all the employees are are committed to support um, local initiatives uh, through their time. So we are, we are giving time to employees to be involved uh, in local uh, communities uh, for those uh, um, specific programs. Uh, I can give you a few examples here. Uh, we've partnered recently with the Royal Botanical Garden of, of uh, New South Wales, and uh, we've, uh, we've helped um, all the initiatives of um, uh, digitalization of the plant um, or the plant specimen, 1.4 million plant specimen have to be digitalized. So we will um, keep uh, all the discoveries, botany discoveries for, you know, forever through this program and it will help the, the uh, obviously the research uh, worldwide, but also it will make, it will preserve uh, some very, um, uh, some treasure that you have here in Australia with, uh, with fantastic plant extracts. So as you know, we manufacture most of our um, products at Pierre Fabre, either prescription drugs or dermocosmetic, um, thanks to plant extracts. So we are very mindful of that. And we are proud to see employees spending their own time um, and going there uh, at the national, you know, at this Royal Botanical Garden and, um, you know, helping to digitalize those old plant specimens. This is really, um, this really speaks volume to all of us. And uh, this is the kind of uh, local initiative which are, you know, very important. We are, you know, we are in Australia and we want to support Australian um, uh, initiatives through our um, employees. Tony, if I could ask you the same question. 
Yes, absolutely. Like um, we have a great program called our Green Premium Program, and that program is all about the design of our equipment, um, making not only environmental regulations from a global footprint, but also making sure that we're able to define that at a local level, making sure that we're giving the right end of life instructions. And it's really important that we make it to the Australian context. We know each culture is slightly different and their expectations are really different, right? So for us, from a Green Premium point of view, We've taken that uh, opportunity to make sure that we're really consistent with what not only the Australian context needs, but I'm sure I'm saying it to the most people on this panel, the, it reflects the regulations that are in those different regions. Um, we're seeing, you know, that there's different end of life needs in different states due to the different EPAs and, and regulatory bodies. We need to make sure that when we're giving information to our clients that we're really clear on making sure that they're compliant to the needs and they're actually able to recycle or reuse the products in line with those regulations as well. So taking that global global initiative and making it local always makes a great impact for us here at China. Thank you. Um, and... Rodrigo, if I can come back to you, um, a slightly different question, um, but maybe not, maybe not too different. Um, how uh, how evolved would you say the the circular packaging economy is in Australia compared to to other countries that you might deal with other parts of the world? Yeah, um, we think that Australia is lagging behind slightly other developed economies in this area, but it's quickly catching up. Uh, we know that uh, histor historically Australia has sought to export large amounts of plastic waste to other countries. But with the new uh, recycling and waste reduction bill uh, from the government, uh, we are very optimistic about this. Uh, we think that with this bill, um, a lot of investment in recycling infrastructure will come uh, and this will be extremely beneficial to the circular economy um, because a lot more of, uh, especially the plastic waste will be able to be recycled. We will have more availability of recycled plastics to acquire, to produce our packaging. And this will also assign some value to plastic waste as well. So it's going to be in our view, a virtual circle uh, and Australia is gonna quickly catch up to the rest of the world on, on this front. Um, we are also seeing a lot more focus on consumer education um, through bodies like APCO, who have launched the Australian Recycling Label. Um, and we ourselves are looking to incorporate the Australian Recycling Label in all of our products uh, as of next year. So all of these initiatives combined, uh, we think that will help uh, Australia quickly catch up to the rest of the developed economies in the world. Thank you. Mark, if I could come back to you, um, if, uh, could I ask you how, how do you think um, the, the new world order, for want of a better word, COVID-19, <laughs> um, has that, um, have you seen immediate um, impacts on, on how um, Suez is having to approach circularity in Australia? If you don't mind, Louise, I, I will come back to that question in a bit because I might want to respond to, to uh, oh, Rodrigo's comment mean. there as well, um, if you don't mind. I, I think indeed, as, as I saw the other players or the members also nodding, I think we see that when it comes to circularity and, and packaging in particular, uh, particular that Australia is still lagging behind. There is indeed new regulation coming, so I, I would like to share the optimism that we have there that we are catching up and hopefully closing that gap. But um, I, I have to say that I'm a, a, bit, a bit conscious and also a bit concerned about this because um, whilst the government has put in those regulations, they say we don't want to export um, our products or our waste anymore, which is absolutely the right thing because we need to take care of our problems here locally. Um, we, we see that it is, remains very difficult to get the investment uh, um, organized and making sure that we have the facilities here that can treat, that can, let's say, make secondary products, but also to make sure, and it ties in with your, your question about supply chain, but there is also more greener procurement. The, play, the, the members here on this panel are absolutely convinced about the necessity for green procurement, right? To make sure that what we're using in, in, our, in our products, in the packaging is sustainable and, and has a recycling uh, value or has been recycled before. But that doesn't cover e each and every one of us. And, and that's where the problem is because what we see from Suez's point of view is that 
we see that it is very difficult to start marketing those products. Um, and hopefully as we progress and there is going to be more education, um, if there is more also, we need incentives around that as well. And sometimes that means that there are taxes for virgin material be used, what we see sometimes overseas, is that is something that is still lacking. So whilst the government federal has had that, I would say, ambition, what we see is lacking today is the, the granularity in terms of a rollout plan there, because they say this is what we do, and they almost like expect industry to, to solve the matter um, collectively. And, and I think many of the members here are willing to, to, to contribute and uh, do their part, but we need some kind of coordination around that. So I am, I'd like to be optimistic and I am typically an optimistic person, but I would say that we still have a lot of work to be done in order to get there. So catching up needs the support and that's what we said again, engagement with stakeholders is something that is absolutely critical. Now come back to your question around COVID. COVID has had an impact for our businesses as well. And I, we, I think when we're thinking about circularity, um, it is absolutely important to think about that. I mean, Laurent mentioned his, his supply chain is predominantly coming from, comes from overseas. And we saw also that in some of our work as well, typically around infrastructure construction. So when we're building wastewater treatment plants or, or waste facilities, sometimes you, you, you source your materials from overseas. And COVID has made it very clear that you're to try to have that the supply chain, let's say uh, more and more localized is absolutely critical to reduce risks, but also to make sure that we are not going to be dependent on, again, the treatment of waste overseas anymore. That is not something that is sustainable. So we need to have shorter supply chains, more localized, making sure that we have the, the safety of, of, um, of supply Organized, and that is something that we have seen also within uh, the, both the water and waste sectors here in Australia for Suez. And maybe to the new world order as well, uh, if I may, because uh, I think when we're thinking about sustainability and, and, and climate, and um, what we have seen is an exceptional year, obviously, in, in 2020 and uh, the end of 2019. I think Australia has been. Uh, I mean, we are, we are known to be a country that has um, significant droughts. So drought management and, and water as a resource is absolutely critical in, in circular economy. And I'm really pleased to hear the members on this panel as well to try to see what they can do in terms of water preservation. Uh, but then we had the, uh, uh, the huge bushfires there that has really made a, a big impact. So we, we also believe that um, the communities and, and the people more at large are right now convinced that we need to close that cycle. We need to do something around it because the climate is impacted. Floods, storms, uh, like again, droughts, they are, they are, let's say, partially also, uh, if not uh, predominantly caused by the way we are, are dealing with our natural resources. So we need to make sure that we have, again, that example, as you said about alu aluminium, which is, is almost uh, uh, circular. And we need to close that on plastics. We need to do that on paper. We need to do that on fibers, but also when it comes to energy and, and, uh, and a lot of other um, resources. So um, yeah, a lot of work still to be done. And, I'm, and once again, I think collectively we, we can do a lot and, and these kind of initiatives will help uh, ra raising awareness, but also to connect the dots to make sure that we, uh, we, we get some of these initiatives started. Thank you. Tony, if we could come back to you. Um, I've got a, a number of things. I'm trying to think which I'm going to ask you about first. Um, shall, we, shall we start with COVID? <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I think for us, um, and I think for the, you know, just the community in general, I, I listen to different members of the community, my friends and work, and you just, the expectations around, you know, sourcing locally on mark point and making sure you know that we've really got that embedded in everything that we do is just prevalent in society now i think more and more people are actually holding big business and small business to account in that space water waste energy i think waste had its time you know with war and waste um and et cetera, et cetera. but i think there's been so much now focus now moving to the energy sector um we're seeing a lot of framework coming out from that federal government as well and making sure that we're you know we're, we're moving towards that more green energy and really supply chain on that green energy. Um, we're seeing a lot on water as well. We're, we're seeing a lot, we, we partner up with a lot of different clients in regards to our solutions in that water industry. So we're seeing lots more coming from that space as well. So 
full COVID effect to that and has COVID and absolutely, you know, the expectations on us and, and making sure that we're promoting and, and pushing through that circular economy space is something that, you know, we're just seeing, uh, you know, drive upwards. It's not something that, you know, people are, are worried about going backwards. It's definitely going to push us through that sustainability journey, I think, quicker. And it's something that we're seeing, you know, our, our global our global business say, you know what, this is just going to make us accelerate our, our climate journey, our, our sustainability journey more because we're really concerned. We're really concerned on our impact on this environment and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that our impact is minimalised. Thank you. And if we could um, just just to ask again, um, we've talked we've talked quite a lot about supply chain, and and you in particular talked about how um, supply chain were were pushing Schneider for um, you know to to make movements and and to encourage that um, particular behaviours. Um, but I guess to to flip that round, um, if Schneider's looking to um, looking for its you know its own procurement. Um, how is how is that approach in terms of you know, prioritising circularity and and bringing your supply chain on board with that sort of ethos? How does that how does that work at Schneider? Absolutely, yeah. we've got a green supply chain program that's part of our global strategy, and that's really embedding our sustainability impacts on on our supply chain. So making sure from from our big suppliers that you know distribute all the way through to the to the little guys that we're making sure that we build that in from a green procurement, as the other members have said, but also making sure that we, we come back and we enable that. Um, so I think there's a big piece on us as a business to make sure that we're enabling that green supply chain, not just dictating, and making sure that we're really partnering with organisations as well. I think there was, you know, the, the, it's all great to have things in contracts, but I think at the end of the day, if we're not partnering and really trying to improve the, the whole supply chain through that kind of, you know, we're in this together method, uh, it just doesn't work. So we're really seeing that that partnering me mentality that we're seeing with, you know, our biggest suppliers is really working for us and making sure that we're dictating, you know, that we would like our, our suppliers to use, you know, environmentally friendly trucks or, or better supply chain and better uh, modelling. It's, it's really something that we're really pushing from that green supply chain initiative. Great, thank you. And Laurent, can I um, can I ask how um, Pierre Fabre has um, has noticed the impacts of of COVID? Particularly? Absolutely, Louise. Uh, you know, uh, first off, I, I cannot agree more with Mark's comment. I mean, this is really you know the uh, shorter supply chain and um, you know relying more on local suppliers to us is is, uh, uh, is almost a survival mode uh, action plan that we have now. Um, it's extremely extremely important. Um, you know, globally, what I can say is that we, we, we've seen that um, uh, consumers have, uh, you know, have uh, um, shifted their mindset uh, through this COVID-19 situation. Uh, they've been, you know, shopping online more and more than before, and um, they were able to, you know, gather so much uh, information about um, the product, about the environment, or uh, behind, behind the scene, what, what's behind the scene. Is, um, through companies, so I think we have we have to be extremely, extremely uh, um, uh, transparent. And uh, I like to maybe emphasize the fact that we know more than ever we have to be very careful in, uh, of course, providing safe product, providing uh, um, effective product, um, uh, eco-responsible product, but also we have to be extremely um, transparent and, and, and truthful in what what we do. Um, uh, there is always a risk of, uh, you know, greenwashing uh, in, in promoting our product, saying, you know, this is a uh, carbon neutrality could be a big debate. Huh? How can we measure? Uh, how can we claim we are carbon neutral? It's, it's something very difficult to, to prove. Uh, even the, the calculation of carbon emission is something that hasn't been really um, standardized uh, across companies. So we have to be extremely careful. That's why we are trying to not overpromise. We, we, we try to also... Um, Educate our consumer because um, you know some uh, there is a lot of uh, green index now uh, of products in, in Europe particularly. So you, you scan your product and you have a, a green index. So you know if your product is uh, sustainable or not. But uh, you know all those kind of score are, are have uh, uh, are designed sometimes by by companies that don't really know what, what how, how to calculate uh, an index. So all this um, COVID-19 um, you know. Uh, um, surrounding, you know, an impact on consumers, we have to be very careful. And, and we are fortunate at PIAFA because, again, you know, being owned by a non-profit organization, 
is, is a really strong uh, ethical guideline and, and ethical um, uh, gatekeeper for us. So what, what we try to, to promote, obviously, is uh, um, you know uh, all the all the commitments, all the efforts we are doing, but we are not perfect. Uh, but we, we aim to be perfect, and we, we, we are following you know um, United Nations guidelines again. We are trying to be as as um, as transparent as possible, and to follow also uh, um, the, the the norms, the, the, the more renowned norms uh, worldwide. So that's that's our commitment. Thank you, well, Rodrigo. Can I come back to you, and we'll we'll leave COVID nineteen. We've all had enough of it. Um, uh, let's go back to the, the consumer education piece, because I think um, when I was when we were chatting the other day, I, I was particularly um, sort of became aware of the I mean, I know that there's a lot more to circularity than recycling, but um, to a lot of people on the street, that's probably where they start. Um, and and we probably all think that, you know, that we're doing our bit, but it's actually not just as simple as washing the, you know, as washing your package, is it? There's there's a whole um, there's a whole education piece to to go with recycling, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, and this is um, related to what we were speaking the other day uh, at the norm. Uh, we thought that just by having recycling, recycled materials or recyclable materials in our packaging, it would be enough for us. But we actually learned that you know the way that we dispose of these materials is actually critical. Uh, so that these materials can be recycled through the system, through the filters that are out there. So one example that uh, that we learned is that, uh, you know, in our infant formulas, we have that aluminum foil um, at the top of the can that is there to, to protect the powder. And um, if we dispose of that just by throwing it uh, in the recycling bin, it will not get detected by the filters that are available out there. So we actually need to to crunch it up uh, so that it's able to be detected by the by the system by the filters so education is actually key for that and that's where you know bodies like apco come in uh, with their education campaigns and they're actually launching a very interesting education campaign called check it before you chuck it um, which is there precisely to educate consumers on how to dispose of the recycle, recyclable materials so that they are effectively recycled through the system. Thank you, that's, that's quite amazing. It's a slightly depressing thing that you, you make the effort and you think you're doing the right thing and then, but, it's, but you haven't done it in the right way so it doesn't get picked up. Um, Mark, you, oh, you must see this at Suez from, from the different angle. You, you're Suez receiving the materials to be recycled and um, and you you recognize there that the, the challenges of how people have disposed of things and um, and in order to be able to maximize that that recycling and reuse yeah no absolutely uh, it's a very good example that uh, Rodrigo mentioned there and and it once again highlights also um, the educational part but also the fact that we strongly believe that we need to have more and more standardization right one of the uh, one of the, the the difficulties that we are facing here in Australia is is the, the fragmentation of of I would say regulation laws, but also the way councils deal with that, right? Uh, and and if you move from one council to another council, then suddenly the way you need to sort separate your bin is going to be different because they have something else in there Just that they want, and, <laughs> and it, it, it confuses people, right? It confuses people, right? And and that is something that we have collectively but once again uh, with APCO and there are a few others there as well that really would like to make sure that we standardize the way we recycle so we have one voice of communication to people because I, I do believe that everybody at the end of the day wants to do the right thing right so it's not a question of not wanting to do it we don't know sometimes that we're doing the wrong things and I, I would be I have to admit that sometimes I thought that I was doing the right thing when somebody told me well you know this doesn't work because indeed our our let's say the technology, whether it's radar or anything else, you know, optical sorters, don't pick it up like that, right? You need to crunch it and then you can see it recognizes it, for instance, right? So there's a lot of work that still uh, still needs to be done, but it also comes down, and I think it's another piece of the, of the, of the equation as well, is that um, 
whilst you have it recycled and we're reaching more and more higher levels of re recycling, obviously, then what we're going to do with the products? So we need to make sure that, again, we, we close that loop by also asking the manufacturers, asking the government to make sure that they are going to use those products because that is unfortunately sometimes still one of the, uh, of the issues because we're talking about um, a recycled waste and there's always an, an element of commodity, or let's say, um, uh, of, of, let's say, contamination in there. We cannot get the purity of products that we would, you would get when you have virgin material, right? And that sometimes causes problems. Typically, if you're thinking about Danone, using recycled products in a food environment, there are questions around that, logical and, and, and defendable questions. So you need to make sure that you can really protect, you know, have food safety there as well, where in other elements it might be less critical, right? We use products that goes into the car manufacturer for bumpers or for just for insulation, has no, no exposure there. So that is something that is a lot easier. Uh, but making sure that you, you, you can deal with all these requirements and also making sure that we are uh, collectively dealing with, I would say, uh, the economics around that, because sometimes the, the economics around that, commodity prices tend to go up and down as markets change. We see that we, ha we have a good product for a, a plastic and then certain leaders, uh, because of oil price dropping, then virgin material becomes cheaper. And then a manufacturer says, sorry, uh, I need to I work in a competitive environment. I'm not going to source anymore the recycled product, product because it's more expensive. Well, I can buy it cheaper if I, if I go to a virgin uh, um, solution. So that's where, again, the circular element comes in, that there is regulation about potentially using virgin material around taxation or incentives is absolutely critical. It, the system doesn't hold itself up um, by itself. It needs the support from, let's say, the, the people here uh, and also government to make sure that we continue to enforce that circularity. And that is something that I mean, we've, we strongly are passionate about and um, yeah, willing to help wherever we can. That's great. I saw a, a, saw a fabulous example the other day about um, the government in Victoria using recycled material, and I, I forget now exactly what it was, but in road surfacing, which I thought was great, quite creative. Yeah, I mean, this is something that's very, very good example, if I may. So we have seen that across the globe that glass is being used as a road based material. And it took us ages to get um, local regulation in place to use that, right? I mean, we're doing that right now here also in, uh, in New South Wales. We just picked up an innovation award around this. But if I'm very honest, there's not that much innovation around it. The technology to do it, yes, because it was new for Australian purposes, but we've seen that across the, across the globe. And this is where we need to take the examples and the, the best practices that we've seen overseas as well and be bold enough to, to also implement that here. But it takes a long time. In, in, again, the, the fragmentation and then people say, well, I'm not so certain about that. Uh, just to, to give you an example, there is hardly any glass processing um, facilities here in Australia. There's not a lot of bottles anymore, right? So glass goes overseas. So if we want to close that loop, if we're thinking about shortening the supply chain, it's a fabulous use of, uh, of, of glass, waste glass product in order to use that for road base and, 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 and it can be done safely and it's, it's working really well. But it took us ages to get um, local regulation in place to, to use that. And there are probably another 10 or 15 of those examples I could use, I could mention here, where we're not as advanced yet here compared to the rest of the world. Well, I'll ask you to save those for the Q&A. Um, uh, I think we should probably, in keeping an eye on time, I think um, I'll go around now and um, if, if I could just ask you for some final uh, closing thoughts, let's go in the, the order that you are across the top of my screen. So Rodrigo, if I could ask you please for, for some final remarks. Just thank you for the invitation um, to share uh, Benon's commitments to the circular economy. And I'd just like to say, reinforce that we are absolutely committed to uh, moving from a linear to a circular economy of packaging. And by 2025, we would like to have all of our packaging materials uh, being recycled, reused or compostable uh, to do our part uh, in protecting the environment. Thank you. Laurent? Yeah, thank you again, Luis, for this uh, for this great uh, great uh, workshop and meeting. I think we 
uh, as a as a you know manufacturer, we we need also to um, to learn more about uh, all the the, the scope of uh, circular economy, and uh, I think we need more and more to uh, to work together to to build a better world. Um, we are you know I think Australia is a is a fantastic uh, is a fantastic um, uh, environment to to really promote uh, those. Uh, those elements, and uh, you know, I can't wait to have more and more uh, debates and, and maybe uh, brainstorming sessions in order for us to, to add a little uh, uh, piece to the to the equation. And um, as a, you know, as a as a as a company, Pierre Fab uh, Group is uh, is uh, you know committed to really um, as our uh, purpose is uh, taking care, living better. Uh, so taking care, living better, is, it works for. For patients, for consumers, but also obviously for for the planet. So trying to trying to uh, to support uh, all the great initiatives here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, I, like the other members of this panel, it's really it's really an important message that comes from Schneider all the way from the top that we are committed to ensuring that we have a sustainable growth. Um, for our business, but also to ensure that we're, you know, I, I like the term greenwashing is that we're not greenwashing and that we're being truthful to our customers and our clients and to the to our, our general public to ensure that we hold ourselves to account as well. Sustainability is such an important thing, not only for us as individuals, but also for our, our local communities as well. So thank you for the time and lovely meeting everybody on the panel as well. Thank you and Mark. Yeah, a big thank you as well, obviously, to uh, uh, all the members of the panel as well and to Fachi and yourself, Louise. Uh, maybe in a closing comment, I know I said a few, maybe, uh, 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 let's say, things that, that are supposed to trigger there as well. But can I maybe say in closing that when it comes to circularity and circular economy, that I'm actually also very optimistic and positive because it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in typically also the younger generations because uh, as many of us see is that the way they like to live, to buy, to consume um, is, is definitely a lot greener and a lot more sustainable than you know, the things that I had in my mind when, uh, when I was growing up. So those demands, those expectations from, from society, from stakeholders are there to help the circular economy. So I do believe it's going to happen, uh, hopefully as soon as possible. And with the great, I would say, and inspirational stories of the members of this panel as well, uh, I think we'll, we'll get there because it is something that we have to do collectively. It's not something that individual companies can do. It is con connecting the dots. And I think these kind of workshops and, and, and interactions are absolutely critical in that. So a big thank you and uh, let's make this happen collectively. Lovely, uh, thank you. Thank you all, I'd like to say. Absolutely, and my my thanks and thanks to uh, thanks to the French Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've learned an enormous amount, and I yes, I'd like Mark. I, I I definitely share the optimism. I think there is there's clearly a lot for us to do, and and for all of us in in different parts of the um, across society to to be playing our part, and um, and I, I hope you're all similarly inspired. Um, so we will wrap that up, and um, and we'll um, go into the Q and A. Thank you all very much.